exercise today. It's Psalm 32. The one whose wrongdoing is forgiven, whose sin is covered over, is truly happy. The one the Lord doesn't consider guilty, in whose spirit there is no dishonesty, that one is truly happy. When I kept quiet, my home, my bones wore out. I was groaning all day long, every day, every night, because your hand was heavy upon me. My energy was sapped as if in a summer drought. So I admitted my sin to you. I didn't conceal my guilt. I'll confess my sins to the Lord, is what I said. Then you removed the guilt of my sin. That's why all the faithful should pray to you during troubled times, so that a great flood of water won't reach them. You are my secret hideout. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with songs of rescue. And this is the part he emphasized. I will instruct you and teach you about the direction you should go. I'll advise you and keep my eye on you. Don't be like some senseless horse or mule whose movement must be controlled with a bit and a bridle. Don't be anything like that. The pain of the wicked is severe, but faithful love surrounds the one who trusts the Lord. <coughs> you who are righteous, rejoice in the Lord and be glad. All you whose hearts are right, sing out in joy. I have been thinking about and praying about this lesson for the last couple of weeks. Pastor Jim has been prodding me to give him a day off. He felt that God has been leading me to stand up and stand firm in my walk with God and talk about my testimony in my daily walk. I think he probably had a good authority that I would never do this on my own. So when this chance for them to take some time for Pastor Jim and Ellen to go and spend some time with the girls, he asked me to take care of the service for them. I've never felt smart enough to be a leader or a teacher. But God has had his hand in this and in the works, and I agree to do this only because God is in control. Because I can say that and believe that, I ask that we now pray. Father, you are present and in control of what is spoken by me. Please open our eyes and our ears to take what is written on my heart by you and use that only as you said to teach and instruct us. Thank you for instructing me with your words and using me as your vessel to bring your body together to bring you all the honor and glory. Amen. Pastor Jim and a few others have told me repeatedly that God wanted me to give him a day off. I have not in all this time had the confidence in myself, or more importantly, the confidence and trust in God that he would be in control, not me. That falls absolutely by divine intervention into place with the word that God has shown me is important to all of us to remember and take to heart as from him. This one word is but. I found myself being convicted of using this word and being led by the Holy Spirit to instruct you on this, this also. He worked his magic in me. I now, because of him, have that confidence in me through Christ Jesus. Recently, during a conversation with a Christian friend of mine, she said to me, I know God is in control, but what she said after this word, I have no idea. I didn't hear it. Because at that word, in an instant, there appeared before me a big, bright neon sign blinking, but, but. It stayed before me until I finally got into a quiet place in time 
to listen to him telling me what he wants me to, to teach. It's a very dangerous thing to say. God has this situation in, in his hand, but, or God is in control, but, by speaking that one little three-letter word, but, we are throwing a net over God. We are try, tying his hands. We are not letting him be in control. That little word can lead to a catastrophic outcome. It can appear to us as God ignoring us in our prayers, when in reality, we are limiting God to what we want him to do. We are, in effect, saying, we have the answer. We've got the solution. We can do a better job than he can, or he will do what I want, and I expect him to do it. I know that if I had ever tried that with my earthly father, well, let's just say I never did get to test that, how on earth could I ever think that I could get away with that with my heavenly father? We have to think about this. We have a free will. He's not standing above us with a why, a whip. He does not force us to submit to him. I am as guilty of this as anyone else. We all are sinners. But our Father, in his unconditional love for us, has not punished us mightily for devout, devout Ah, excuse me, for doubting him. Praise God, he has forgiven us. He's only asking us to trust him. The lesson to be learned here is this. We're human. We all screw up. We all are going to do and say things that are not right. The best that any of us can learn is that we, us, all of you and I, are chosen children of a very loving and forgiving God. He knows that we all are very messed up, yet he's merciful. Jesus already paid for our mistakes. As long as we call on him, repented, repentantly asking for forgiveness, and trying not to do the wrong thing again and again and again, we will be that much closer to being in his presence in our forever home. And I need to tell you something else as I am confessing to you. As Pastor Jim always says, and is our motto, faith alone in Christ alone. As I sat putting this together, I was reminded of all the blessings that Wayne and I have received since coming here two years ago. And the many things I've learned about myself. A big regret is that I never understood how to let go and let God go without a fight. I will always be thankful to Katie and Lynn for bringing us here. And I actually learned what that means. Faith alone and Christ alone. All of me, depending on all of him, all the time, and in all things. May we all learn to think before we speak, and may God continue to cover us in his grace. Amen. Brad, you want that floor, please? Sure. We're kind of doing this a little bit out of order today. <laughs> 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 Up on the top on your yeah, yeah top. okay. Uh, 
Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I was going to give you guys a little testimony, and then I was going to read a few pages from a book by Pat Robinson that I really enjoyed, and I figured you guys might too. Uh, my mother, she was uh, growing up, I remember my mom being a real nervous lady and depressed. She was in bed a lot. She used to drink whiskey when she was nervous. And then one day, she went to a prayer study. She was going for a little bit. It's a Lovejoy Gospel. He's got a big church now. Yeah. But he started as a, you might know his name, Ron. You know what I'm talking about. His name is Ron, too. Yeah. But they started out at a prayer study on Lovejoy Street. And now he's got a huge church over, you know, I think it's on Walden or that Broadway. Genesee. Genesee, yes. And uh, my ma, I remember she came home one day and she had like a globe to her. And she read a passage out of the Bible, exactly what her problem was. And she accepted the Lord that day. Oh. And I remember she was a little overzealous. She was really bubbly, and we all thought she was nuts. <laughs> and, uh, you know, she was telling us about the word and Jesus and it. And I sort of had like a blind, I had like a blind eye to it for probably a decade. And then I went into the Army, and uh, I, gr I grew up, and I sort of dropped all the bad things I was doing, and, but I was still missing something. And I met some guy, I remember, his name was Sergeant Bennett, and he was a Christian. And I was saved in 1980. And it had a lot to do, because I, I always thought a lot of things my mother told me, and it had a lot to do with me being saved. But after all that, me, my two brothers, my sister, my daughter, and a bunch of my nephews were all saved. And it was all boiled down to my mother. She helped us all. So that's a testament I'll give to my mother. And um, let's pray for Pastor Jim and Ellen for the travel mercy going to visit their kids today. And uh, here's a few pages from uh, Pat Robinson that I enjoyed, I, I wanted to share. Uh, here's, here's how it starts out. Most people I know are content without Jesus. Why should I try to make them do anything different? And here's the, here's the answer that uh, uh, he gives, Pat Robinson. If you truly love someone, you want to help them. If you had a friend who was enjoying life, but you happened to notice a cancerous tumor growing on an individual's face or leg, wouldn't you interfere with their harmony long enough to get them to a doctor before he or she died? If you really love someone, you would disquiet that person about a problem that could potentially destroy him or her. If someone is driving the car blissfully down a road, getting ready to run off a cliff, why don't you try to get that person's attention and warn him of the impending danger? Likewise, likewise, if you see someone leading a destructive lifestyle and you really care for that person, you are compelled to say something such as, if you keep this up, you are going to kill yourself. That is what sharing the gospel is all about. Some people actually have grown accustomed to living in darkness, ignorant of oblivious to the joys of living in the light. Many people prefer to live in spiritual darkness. But if you care about your friends or your family members who do not know Jesus, pray for an opening in their hearts and minds and then do all you can to bring them to the knowledge of the Lord. Don't be fooled by appearances. You might be amazed at how few people are truly content. Many people are searching, looking for something better than the temporary happiness they have found. They know there must be more to life than simply waiting to die. Their hearts are hungry to really know God. St. Augustine said, our hearts are restless so they find their rest in thee. Every level of society, at every income and educational level, people are hungry for genuine spiritual reality. They may not show it. They may look as happy as they can be, but inside, 
they have a deep, unsettled feeling that something is not right. God loves them, and he can disquiet them so they will sense their need. The Holy Spirit convicts of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That's why before you start talking to people about their relationships with God, the most important thing you can do is pray. Pray that God will reveal to them their need, that they will sense it and want to find the answer. Um, Pat Robertson and a friend were visiting people at some housing projects. They were close to the church. The population of that part of town was primarily African American, right on the edge of the Bronx, a pretty tough part of the city. They went to an apartment building but didn't know anyone who lived there. So they knocked on the door to find somebody that they hoped would want to know God. We asked the uh, Lord to lead us, and then took my finger and literally went down the roster of names on the bulletin board listing the people in the building. My finger pointed to one name, and it felt as if something had hit me in the stomach. I knew this was the one. So Harold and I stepped into the elevator. We went up to the apartment and rang the doorbell. A black woman in her late 30s answered the door and stared back at us. We said, we are from the First Reformed Church in Mount Vernon, and we just came by to talk to you about the Lord. Come in, she offered. I talked to her for about five minutes and recognized that she was in desperate condition. Finally, I just simply blurted, would you like to know the Lord? Oh, yes, she said. Let's just kneel down right here, the three of us. We will ask the Lord to do something. I said, you pray with me, and we will ask God to touch you. I began to pray, and she, repeat, she repeated my words after me. When I said, in Jesus, I ask you to come in my heart, the woman suddenly called out, oh, yes, Jesus, I've got to have you. Jesus, please come into my heart now. When we left, she was a new person. Her sins were forgiven, and she was rejoicing in God. That is why we need to see every person who doesn't know Jesus as lost. That's why we need to boldly present the gospel, trusting God to give us the right opportunity. You don't have to have all the answers. Jesus is the answer. God is already preparing the hearts of people who want to know him. We don't force anything, nor should we ever try. All we have to do is follow God's decision, find them, and tell all them the good news. Amen. And I'll go through this uh, a couple prayers here. Uh, I'll say, I'll say, we'll usually say tender, but prayer request for Doug and his health and finances. Debbie and Tammy, and there's a few other people in his church, quite a few of them, a healing of the back. Uh, Hobart with his job situation. 